for this program. And uh, so I just uh, so uh, I just want to know from you. I know many of you are uh, from already doing work in cosmology and you are from different institutes. But just I know that some people are from uh, from masters or beginners PhD. So I just want to know that uh, to set our course, uh, the pace of the course, to know how many of you uh, don't have any cosmology experience or very little cosmology or GR. Can you just raise your hand? Okay. These are, uh, these are our MSP students, but uh, people who are mostly uh, registered under the GAN. <coughs> so can you just raise your hand how many of you uh, uh, don't have any prior experience in cosmology or very little? Okay. Okay, fine. But okay, we have one, one or two lectures just to do a very basic. Maybe some of you have already, most of you have already done, but just to keep the pace right. Uh, so we we'll start uh, every day. We have a uh, there are three lectures and one tutorial and discussions. Except on Wednesday, the Ravi will be giving a colloquium at JNU uh, Physics Department or School of Physical Sciences. So you are all welcome to attend that. So that day there will be no tutorial or discussion. Other than that, all the day we have a one hour tutorial and discussion. Otherwise, Ravi is here, so you can always ask your question. So um, that's it. And if you have any, we have all the uh, Wi-Fi and all those details have been given. If you have any issue or inquiry, you can contact me or any student at CGP, so they can help you. Uh, so welcome, and hope you will have a very nice course. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I'll be putting these slides uh, online. There's some place to put yeah. them, no? Yeah, yeah. Um, so so you will get them. Um, and uh, sort of my plan is to try to actually make use of these tutorials. Um, and uh, so I was going to try to provide, uh, uh, you know, sort of the most up-to-date or reasonably up-to-date data sets to play with during the tutorials. That means those will be kind of numerical. Okay. Um, but uh, okay. But we, we can see, and uh, a lot of cosmology is done with. Uh, so, so it's a golden, they were saying earlier, it's a golden age for cosmology because a lot of data is coming online and is being made available to the public. Uh, and so that means that you can analyze stuff that people have not analyzed yet, right? So, uh, so, so that necessarily means that there will be some stuff that is pretty numerical. But because it's hands-on, uh, it's a good opportunity to just talk about uh, what black boxes already exist to analyze, and what things you will have to produce yourself. Yeah? So that kind of stuff will happen in the tutorials. And as we're going through, uh, if there are questions, sometimes I'll say, oh, that can be done in the tutorial. Sometimes I'll say, let's try to, do, let's try to deal with it here. OK, um, okay. So, uh, so this, first, this first one hour is going to be a little bit strange, because it's going to be all the stuff that we will not do <laughs> In the rest of the, the rest of the lectures, okay. So it's the it's the background of cosmology uh, that that after that uh, we're not going to touch, okay. And that's because this uh, this is a course about st structure formation, and uh, and in cosmology there are two parts. One part is the geometry of the background universe, and the second is how structure grows in the universe. Um, and so we're really concentrating on that second part. And so, the, so, the, so this first hour today, I was going to do a bit of the geometry stuff. And then, then Anjan will do uh, a little bit more of the background cosmology, setting up the geometry. Uh, and then this afternoon, uh, I'll get in, I'll, I'll start so the big picture of growth of structure. OK? Um, all right. Oh, let me see if this will make the movie go. So this is a map of the microwave background. Um, so everyone is familiar, because this kind of format will show up fairly often when we look at maps of the sky. Yeah? So, the, so the way this works is you are looking, and in front of you, that's the middle of the map. And then the stuff that is completely behind you, that stuff is taken like this 
and put there and put there. And that way you see the full sky. Okay, so that's the, the standard um, astronomy way, way of showing the whole sky. So as we zoom, there were hot and cold patches in the sky. So people have seen this, right? This is a map of uh, W map, so uh, the, the microwave background. Hot and cold patches. What is the temperature difference between the hottest and the coldest? 10 to minus 5, okay? So part in 100,000, okay? And uh, what is the typical size of the patches? Ah, okay, that's the physical size. Yeah. Uh, one Hubble radius, what does he mean by one Hubble radius? What do you mean by one Hubble radius? Distance light traverses in the age of the universe. In the age of the universe, at that time. At that time. Yeah? How long ago was this? It was a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, 300,000 years after the Big Bang, maybe 400,000 years after the Big Bang, yeah? Um, but, uh, um, when is the present? So now we are how many years after the Big Bang? 14 point something. 14 point something. Yeah? Okay. Um, so there were these hot and cold patches. Do we know what caused them? We have a reasonable, we have a reasonable idea. Do you have a reasonable idea? <laughs> yes, no. I'll talk a little bit about it. Okay? For now, it's kind of an amazing thing that we can do cosmology almost without understanding why. No, we, it's enough to know that there's something about the size of the universe at that time that makes the size of these spots. Okay, so, so we will make use of that, but we will try to have a little bit more physical understanding also of, of these spots. Okay, we're zooming in. This is supposed to show you the evolution of the universe. Okay, um, and so, so the universe was originally quite, uh, quite smooth, right? Fluctuations are one part in 100,000. We zoom into one of these patches, and nothing happens, no? It stayed the same for some time. What is, what is in the universe at this time? There were the photons, because we could see the photons, we received them. But the photons travel through plasma of gold, uranium, pure protons, pure neutrons, electrons. Yeah. Um, at the time that they're traveling, was so it's mainly hydrogen. So mainly protons, mainly neutrons, uh, uh, electrons. Are the electrons? Free? No. Where are they? Are they with the protons? No. No. They are physically with the protons. It's not in an atomic model. Uh, it's not in an atomic model? Yeah. OK. Um, so that's, was there ever a time when it was bound to the, to the protons, when the electrons were bound to the protons? After recombination, maybe. Right, so for some time they were, oh, so sorry. So le, le, let's be, I, I wasn't saying things carefully. So electrons can be coupled with the photons or electrons can be coupled with the protons. <laughs> okay. So they, was, so they were coupled with the photons early on. Yeah. And then what? But what was, so what is recombination? So what is combining? Protons and ah, so the electrons uh, stuck with the protons. Yeah. For some time or also today? Also, also today. Yeah. Oh, no, so half, how many say also today? And how many say reionization? <laughs> I heard the word. <laughs> yeah, OK. So, so, so we'll go through a little bit of this history, okay? Um, and uh, so, so what is going on here is that the universe has hydrogen in it. And in this case, the hydrogen has its, the protons have their electrons, okay? Um, but 
very soon that will stop being true. And before this time, also the, hydro the protons did not have the electrons. Okay, so this is that brief interval of time in which, in which they were bound. Okay. Um, okay, so now you can kind of see a little bit of lumpy stuff. There we go. Okay, now we see the first light switching on. These are the first stars forming. The first stars formed and they put out high energy photons. Those high energy photons, break. good. They could break what? Break the, break the uh, bonding between electrons and protons. Okay, so they could give the electrons enough energy to, to jump. Jump up. Yeah? And that is the reionization. The hydrogen became ionized again. So that, this event is the thing that people want to discover and hope to discover in the next two years. Okay, so this is the next frontier. Last year, I would have said gravity waves are the next frontier, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but now that has been crossed, okay? So, so the next big thing is reionization. And about a month ago, there was a claim that it had been detected, okay? It's a slightly controversial claim. And one of the instruments that has the best chance of proving it right or wrong is GMRT outside Pune, okay? And so, so fingers crossed, GMRT will be the one that makes, makes the call, okay? Um, okay. Um, I also thought that when I was showing this slide, then I would be, say, I would be asking you, um, what other instrument will detect this? And that other instrument is supposed to be JWST, very good, right? And JWST has got delayed by nearly two years, okay? The stated goal of JWST is to image those flashes of light, the first stars. GMRT, that is measuring something else. What is that measuring? Intensity of, of, of meaning, meaning of the gas, not of the stars, yeah? And so it's a very beautiful complementarity. We're fortunate that both experiments are happening at the same time, JWST and uh, GMRT, yeah? that you get a consistency check of, uh, of the physics. Okay, um, so, so this is going to be very exciting yeah, in, the, in the next couple of years. Um, this is the, ch the transition of the universe from being dark to, to being light again. Yeah? Uh, when did this happen? Or when, when do we think this happened? Will a redshift value do? Because that's all I remember. <laughs> okay, redshift value will do. Redshift value, uh, Z6 is the first stars. 6, 30. No, uh, 30 or 20. Okay. Around 17. Around 17 and a half. <laughs> no, come on. Okay. So the, um, very good. 6 is, a, why, why is he thinking 6? Because I would also have said six. Six is a real quasars. Yes. Ah, so yeah. Four and three is closer to reanalysis. Uh, no, no. So thirty is thirty. Is twenty the is the first stars. Yeah. First stars. And uh, but but now there's a difference, right? Because it's not clear that the stars can reionize. That the stars will send out photons that are energetic enough to 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 ionize the hydrogen. They may excite the hydrogen but maybe not ionize it completely. And so there are some ideas that say um, that uh, stars can't do it, and you have to wait till you have uh, bigger structures. So th that's some of the excitement for doing the experiment to see which is right, no? And, uh, and so the quasars, so these are the big giant galaxies by redshift of six, and so those guys, they can certainly do it. They're putting out super high energy radiation. They can ionize the hydrogen for sure. But they're very few. If they're very few, it's not for sure that they can ionize everything, <laughs> OK? And so you can make lots of stars, but the stars themselves don't have enough, not obviously enough energy to ionize all the hydrogen. And the quasars certainly can, but it's not obviously enough quasars. So there's this, that's why there's this fight. OK. Um, so the first stars switch on. 
and then gradually more and more stars form, and then they cluster together. Most of what we'll be describing is this process of the clustering, okay? Until uh, gradually they come together, they make galaxies, um, and uh, then uh, the galaxies themselves cluster, and they make clusters of galaxies until we see the large-scale structure today. Yeah, and so that was the microwave background, and then uh, through that stuff was all the structure to the present. Okay. Um, so the, oh, I, I can do this again now. Um, and so, so, so that's the schematic, right? That uh, there was the CMB, there was some inflation, stuff like that. So we won't talk about what made the CMB, though early universe is another very hot topic, okay? Um, then we have the dark ages until the first stars switch on, then the hydrogen is ionized, and then the photons are traveling through to us as the structure develops, okay? There's a fair amount of information on here. Um, so you can see that the universe inflated, it expanded very quickly with time, right? Then it expanded, and now it's doing this other thing here, right? So this is the accelerated expansion that we think is because of something that we call dark energy because we don't know what else to call it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, okay, so, so that, that's what this is trying to show you here. Um, and uh, and if, you, if you look at a picture like this, then you would wonder if the photons that started out from the microwave background can travel through the universe, can they really reach us without interacting with anything? Or does every photon that set out from here, does it interact with gas along the way? Do it does. It does? That's why you have your 21 centimeters. That's the 21 centimeter. What about after that? What is there for it to interact with? Oh, yes, okay, galaxies clusters. So, if, so, so galaxies clusters really means big balls of gas, okay? But... Would it be lensed by uh, uh, Okay, so he's, he's used some other word, right? So he's, he's used another word, lensing. So we'll come back to the lensing, would okay? It, would it do that? Yes. So... Um, so, so, but so let, let's, let's first ask, what has to happen? The light has to travel. If it hits a pile of gas, then it will interact with the gas. But will it interact with the ionized hydrogen? In what way? Because the electron is gone, right? So can it, in, what, what does it do to the... Ah, if the hydrogen is ionized, the electron is gone. So then there's just a proton. So it has to interact with free electrons. Or inverse Compton scattering, okay? And so if we have, if we have a tight ball of gas somewhere that, where there's, you know, the, the, the gas has enough energy, then yes, this will happen. So we will discuss this soon. So one possibility is that you have a, you have a, a dense enough ball of gas that the photons are quite likely to interact with the, with the electrons by some inverse Compton scattering, get some energy. That's possible. Is it likely? For it to be likely, there should be many tight knots. Okay? To make a tight knot, I have to take the stuff in the universe and I have to make a tight knot. That means I took it from the rest of the universe, so the rest of the universe is empty. So I, to, know, to be able to answer the question, how likely is it that I will bang into something, and inverse Compton scatter, I have to know how dense are the knots compared to the rest of the universe. We will estimate that it's about, these things are about 200 times denser than the background. That means that one out of 200 of the volume of the universe has stuff. And so the, the inverse Compton scattering happens, but it's very rare, okay? Um, because the gas is concentrated in a few places, okay? Um, but we'll, we'll make these estimates properly soon. Okay? Soon, tomorrow, day after. Okay. Um, okay, 
So, uh, so, th so the other thing was maybe the photons don't, uh, don't interact and have collisions, but maybe they are deflected, right? Maybe they don't travel in a straight line because of gravitational lensing. That is true, yeah? And so as the photons travel from here through the universe, they will be distorted along the way, and so we'll be, we'll be studying that process as well, okay? That process cares about the total mass. The, the mass does not have to be electrons and protons, so it doesn't have to be baryons, okay? It can be anything, okay? Um, some other sort of uh, introduction to, astro uh, to cosmology questions. So the night sky is dark. This thing is called Olber's paradox. Yeah, how many of you have heard of Olber's paradox? Um, okay, about half of you. So the question is, why is the night sky dark? Not because the sun is on the other side of the sky, um, but because of something deeper, right? And uh, so the deeper thing is what? So, so here I'll, I'll try to make a quick sketch of this argument. Um, so you are here, and you're trying to look at the stars. And so, so imagine that there are stars here, there are stars here, there are stars here, and we're just looking at one of these shells, okay? And then there are stars that continue further out, continue further out. And so to make the rough argument, you say, well, um, there should be some number density of stars, and each, each of these stars has some luminosity. And so, uh, you know, if I was making some observation, then, you know, I look in the sky, right? So I, I will look and I will count some number of stars. Number density times luminosity. And so the question is, um, what's that luminosity? And is it bright enough to make the sky bright? And uh, most of you answered correctly, it's not because you see the sky is, <laughs> is black at night, but, uh, but why? Right? And so Olber's paradox is, is trying to answer why. And I put the answer here, right? That uh, when you make the calculation, you say, well, all the light can reach us, meaning the light is not blocked along the way because it's rare to be inverse Compton scattered and things like that. Okay? Um, and so, so there's nothing blocking the light, nothing doing strange things to it. Uh, it travels to us. Uh, there's, you know, it decreases as is the inverse square. So you might say, oh, these guys will appear fainter than the guys nearby. On the other hand, there's more volume in this shell than in this shell. It's going as 4 pi r squared dr. And so the inverse square is canceled by the volume factor. Um, and, uh, and that argument says if they're, both, if they're canceling out, then it's possible that you will get, you'll get a bright sky. No? The inverse square law is not going to save you. Um, and uh, that is true if you get to integrate all the way out to infinity. And so the night sky being dark is telling you something about this. Some, some of these assumptions is not right. And, uh, and the resolution says there's an upper limit to this integral. Okay. Uh, and we'll, we'll make a quick estimate of, of that, uh, that soon. Okay. Um, so, so the resolution is speed of light is constant and the universe is finite age and it's the finite age which sets an upper limit for the travel. Okay. Uh, concept of the Hubble volume. Hubble volume was mentioned earlier. The Hubble volume is essentially the speed of light times the age of the universe, meaning as the universe gets older, Hubble volume is bigger. We will have to be careful. So these seem like pretty straightforward statements, but they will all matter tomorrow when we, start, when we start calculating things and being careful about what distance we mean and things like this, okay? Um, and so, um, so, so, th so this, this scale will, uh, will grow uh, with time, the Hubble volume. Other ideas we need, to, we need to define. We like to say the universe is homogeneous and isotropic, yeah? So, so this is a universe that is not isotropic. There's a preferred direction. This is a universe that is not homogeneous. The, spend, the center is, uh, is special, yeah? Okay. Um, we know the universe is expanding, yeah? So, so that's a picture of Hubble. To decide that, we had to make measurements of things that were at bigger and bigger distances from us. 
Is everyone familiar with the distance ladder? How many know what, I, what this is about? One, two of you. How many don't know? OK, good. Um, so uh, so in, order to, in order to measure, in order to conclude almost anything in cosmology, we have to measure distances. And it turns out that distances are incredibly hard to do, hard to measure. Okay. Um, I've already mentioned um, the reionization experiments. But there's an even nicer thing happening in two weeks, three weeks, April 25th. April 25th, there's a satellite called Gaia. And Gaia has been measuring the positions of stars in our galaxy to extreme precision. The amount of data that will, the amount more data that we will get from Gaia compared to before Gaia will change not by factor of two or by factor of 10, by factor of 1,000. Okay, on April 25th, the positions and motions of stars of 1.5 billion stars will be released. Okay, this is going to change the way we know our galaxy completely. Okay, it's going to be a, an, an incredible data set. That is because Gaia measures distances to stars using the one method that we are all confident about that has very little systematic error. It's pure geometry. This is parallax. And this is saying, as the Earth goes around the sun, we change our position. So when we look at a star, then the position of the star seems to change. Because if we look at it from here or we look at it from there, it seems to be in a slightly different position. If it's close to us, that change in position is bigger. If it's far from us, it's smaller. And as a result, um, we can, by measuring how much the angular position changes over the course of a year, we can estimate, uh, we can estimate the distance to the, the stars. So that one is kind of clean. Unfortunately, the stars are so far that the angular shifts are very small. And the angular shifts being very small mean that you cannot measure, you cannot use this technique for things that are far away. So that means we have a whole sequence of ways of estimating bigger and bigger distances. Yeah. Um, and uh, so we have, so we have the trigonometric parallax. And then typically what happens is you try to find something that is brighter so you can see it to a bigger distance. Where, so where you could see it at a small distance, so you could measure the parallax. And similar objects that you could measure at big distances. So you can calibrate here, and then you can use the calibration at the bigger distance. Okay? And then you use this. You use a method. This one is using main sequence fitting. So this one is stars, when they evolve, the, the massive stars evolve faster. Okay? And so that means, so it, we, we get lucky, all right? It turns out that if you plot the luminosity of a star versus its brightness, versus its temperature, hot is to the left, um, then the stars all sit on a straight line. Here you can see two straight lines. So imagine, imagine that really they should be only on one. And imagine that for the light blue, you've measured the distance using parallax. So you know that this is correct. For the purple ones, you don't know. They were too far away to, for you to measure parallax. And so you can measure the temperature, because when you measure the temperature, you measure something from a spectrum. But you, and the spectrum does not depend on the distance from you. But the brightness does. And so you, you measure some brightness, but to know the intrinsic luminosity, you have to know the distance. And that means you can slide this vertically up and down until it sits on the blue. And when you have done that, then you say, ah, now I know the distance. And because the stars are bright, it's a, it's, a, it's a sequence of stars, you can see this to bigger distances than you can measure the parallaxes. So now you have another method that can go out to as far as you can see stars. And then you have to go to even bigger distances. So you, you make some tricks to do with uh, super bright stars that vary in, uh, in brightness even brighter objects, and so on. So, so there's, there's a whole sequence of these things that we go through. 
until the ones that we'll pay that, that have been most useful in cosmology are the supernovae. So these are a special kind of star. When they explode, they're all the same kind of explosion, which means that their luminosity is a standard candle. That means that from the apparent brightness, you know the distance. Okay. It's uh, 4 pi distance squared times the brightness. Okay. Um, and, uh, and so most of what we, not most, but a lot of uh, geometrical tests of cosmology use these guys, use the fact that we know intrinsically what their luminosity is. Of course, we don't know, right? Because it's true that the thing that exploded could all, you know, all the things that explode can be the Chandrasekhar mass, 1.4 times the mass of the sun. But they're in galaxies. The galaxies can be dusty. The galaxies can be more dense. They can be less dense. Maybe early in the universe, the galaxies were slightly different than late in the universe. So there are systematic effects that people have to be careful about in order to use these guys. Okay, so there's a fair amount of work associated with using these guys as standard candles. I'll, dis I'll discuss some of it, but not too much. Okay, um, so this is one of those things that if you're interested, ask me in the tutorials. Okay. Um, and uh, so, so anyway, so, the, so the, the basic message is there's a whole bunch of steps that we go through in order to estimate uh, distances to objects. Okay, the other thing we measure are the spectra of objects. And from the spectra, we can measure, um, you know, the various absorption lines. And from the absorption lines, we can compare objects that seem to have similar spectra but the lines are slightly shifted, so there's the Doppler shift. Everyone is fine with that. Um, and so wavelengths are shifted longer, so these things are moving away from us. And so this is, the, this is a plot from 100 years ago um, showing the speed with which something is moving relative to us compared to the distance from us. This was the plot that was made by Hubble, and he was brave enough to put a line through that, right? And, uh, and, so, and so, so one thing is just to put, to put a line, and the second is to think about what the line means, right? Um, and, uh, and so there were, there were two striking things about the line. One is, one is that it, there's a line, which means there are no negative velocities here. In fact, there are very few negative velocities, right? Almost all the velocities are positive. So everything is going away from us, right? There are a handful of nearby guys that are not going away from us, that are approaching us, but everything else is going away, and the more distant things are going faster. We now know we should think of this as an expansion. Um, is that idea familiar to everyone? If I say that the expansion, that, that this kind of plot, it has to be a straight line, it cannot be a parabola. Is that idea familiar? Less familiar? How many think it's not familiar? A couple of you, so come talk to me, come talk to me afterwards. It's on the slides, but I don't have so much time, so I want a new printer. Um, uh, so I, I have some details on the slides that we can go through, but I, but I won't go through them here, yeah, because most of you, most of you know. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, so, so that was Hubble's line, right? One axis was velocity, the other axis was distance, and the slope we call Hubble's constant. Okay. Um, all right. We've talked about parsecs. We'll be talking a lot about uh, some funny units, right? So astronomy units. So we will talk about parsecs and megaparsecs and light years. Everyone knows that terminology? Yeah? OK. Um, all right. So when Hubble made this, then he put a line through it. The line goes through 0. You can measure the slope of this line. And, uh, and the line was, let me see, was from 0 to 1,000, from 0 to 2. So the slope is uh, 500. Okay, um, and uh, and so 
that Hubble constant was 500. So one over, so this is kilometers per second per megaparsec. If I take the inverse of this, then I will get megaparsecs divided by kilometers per second. So it will be something with units of time. Okay. Um, and so let's play that game, right? We'll take the megaparsec over 500 kilometers per second. We'll get some large number of seconds from that. That large number of seconds is 2 billion years. OK, so what does this mean? So, it's in a, so, so it, one way of thinking of this number is to say if everything was in the same place 2 billion years ago, and then they move out, then you will get some line like this. Okay, um, And uh, so, so time when everyone was in the same place was 2 billion years ago. But you guys told me before the universe is 14 billion years old. And so something went wrong. It can be that the universe changed its speed while it was expanding. Right? It need not always have been expanding at this speed. Or it could be this number is wrong. Or it could be a combination, or it could be a combination of both. Yeah? Um, and uh, so it turns out that in this case, um, the number is wrong. And the reason the number is wrong is because to make it, we had to make, we had to go through these steps. When Hubble made it, he didn't, re he used, he got up to here, he used this method. And when he used this method, he didn't realize that there were two types of stars. And uh, because there are two types of stars, they were giving two different distance estimates, and uh, he, was, he was unlucky. Okay. Uh, once they realized that that was the case, then they quickly fixed those distance estimates. Now we, make, uh, now we use the supernovae to do it. When we do that, what do we have? So remember that previous plot that Hubble was brave to put a line through was 2 megaparsecs. This is now 500 megaparsecs. There's still a straight line going through it. The slope of the straight line is uh, of order 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. There's a huge fight going on just now about whether this number is 67 or 73. Okay? We've come a long way since Hubble. All right? Um, okay, so we will come back to that fight uh, later in the week. Okay. Um, all right? So, so that's, the, that's the current uh, sort of data set. Now we can take that number, 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec, take the inverse of that, and that inverse it gives us the time, and that time is 14 billion years. Okay, um, and uh, so if the expansion speed has stayed constant, then the age of the universe is 14 billion years. Okay. Um, all right. So that's that's this picture. Okay. Um, so 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 now that we know the Hubble constant. And we said that 1 over the Hubble constant is the age of the universe. Then we know that the scale, the Hubble horizon, that is something like c times t, the age of the universe. So it's c over h. So that's this guy. So now we can do this integral that we were doing for Olber's paradox. Yeah? So for Olber's paradox, we said we should take the number density of galaxies times the luminosity of each galaxy. So in the local universe, the number, of number density of galaxies times the luminosity of each galaxy is something like this. This is sort of the density, the luminosity density. Okay? It's roughly one galaxy per cubic megaparsec. Okay? Um, and uh, it's a little less than a galaxy. A galaxy is how much? 10 to the 10 times the mass of the sun, or 10 to the 10 stars, like the sun. Okay? Um, so it's le a little less than that. Mm -hmm. And then if you say, well, I want to get a rough estimate of the flux that I should get, I should receive on Earth, then I should do something like, you know, the 4 pi dr squared times the number density times the luminosity reduced by the inverse square law. Okay. So if we do that, this dr squared cancels dr squared. That was the thing we said before. If galaxies don't evolve, then the number density is a fixed thing. I put it already outside the integral. The typical luminosity of a galaxy, that's a fixed thing. I can take it outside the integral. Okay? These are not correct assumptions. 
but just to have an idea of how to think. Okay. Um, and then uh, because the R squareds cancel, the four pi's cancel, you just have a dr from zero to the Hubble, the Hubble scale. Okay. Um, and so we'll get this number times c over h. We know the speed of light. We know that one over h is uh, 14 billion years. Um, and so we can just uh, multiply this out. And uh, so, so that, that, that's the number. Not a very meaningful number this way. Okay, but if we convert this into, if we convert from megaparsecs into AU, Earth-Sun distance, then you get quite a meaningful number. You get a tiny fraction of the luminosity of the Sun from one AU. And that's like saying, um, you know, instead of having the sun there, you have a light bulb there. And that's why the night sky is dark. Okay? Now, of course, we made a lot of crazy assumptions, right? Galaxy, number density is constant. Luminosity is constant. Uh, the integral is as simple as we've written. None of these things are right. But they give a basis for making a discussion because, you know, to go from the sun to a 40-watt light bulb is many, many, many orders of magnitude. And we probably haven't screwed that up so badly. Okay. So, so some of what we'll be doing is trying to make better estimates of all these things. Okay. N not to explain why the night sky is dark, but, you know, for, for okay. All right. Um, this was setting up why the, why the expansion must be linear, something about redshifts. You have the notes, so you can look at this stuff uh, there, the linear law. Um, okay. Um, one other thing that we get with the, with the Hubble constant is a, is, a, is a very simple idea, okay? Is a, is a very simple way of using the number, okay? Um, and again, this is not a completely correct argument, but it's a good hand-wavy way of getting a number that is useful to think about. Back okay? of the napkin. Back of the envelope kind of calculation, right? And, uh, and so the, the, the very crude statement is, you know, if you have some speed, um, and you want to know if uh, the things are going to expand and collapse again, or they're going to expand forever, then this is like an escape speed problem. And, uh, and so you want to know if uh, you want to compare kinetic and potential energy. Yeah. Um, and so potential energy, you will have said, is something like uh, GM over distance. And uh, kinetic energy, you would have said, is V squared over 2. So half V squared should be GM over distance. Okay, uh, and so 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 that's what that's what this thing is saying. And uh, in place of v, you can substitute h times d. Um, and uh, and so this is you know the kinetic energy, the potential energy, and uh, then you put all the factors of d together. So you'll get uh, a density. So you put m over d cubed to get a density. So that means that you have to put the d cubed. Um, and so now you have 2g density, 4 pi, d, squared, d cubed, d. And so we, where, this, where this thing is equal, we call that the critical density. Um, and when you insert g and Hubble's constant, uh, then, you can, then you get, again, physical things that you can think about, right? How empty is the universe? Um, and so it's roughly 6 protons per cubic meter or one galaxy per cubic megaparsec. Yeah, a galaxy that's uh, 10 billion, 100 billion times the mass of the sun. Okay. Um, and uh, so, so these are the numbers for the, for the current Hubble constant. Okay. Um, let's skip this. Let's measure the expansion. Okay. So what are we doing? We're plotting the speed with which something is receding from us versus the distance it is from us. Now we want to ask the question, was the universe expanding the same in the past as it is today? The prejudice is it was probably expanding faster in the past. Does that make sense? Does everyone agree with that? So if I, if I have some, if I, if I throw this up, it goes up, it slows down eventually it is going to fall back down. So it keeps slowing down. That means initially the speed was fast and then gradually it's slowing down. Yeah? Do I expect that to have been true of the universe? Its self-gravity is trying to slow everything down. 
or not. 20 years ago, the prejudice was it should have been slowing down. Okay, so 20 years ago, the prejudice was, oops, 20 years ago, the prejudice was that uh, the universe was expanding faster in the past and slower today. Now, the slope of this line is the speed of the expansion. Okay, and so, um, and so if it is expanding quickly, that means this, the speeds are all high for the same distance. So this is fast expansion, this is slow expansion. Okay? So if it was expanding faster in the past, then we are expecting that as we measure objects at bigger and bigger distance from us, then we should get galaxies sitting here as we go to big distances. So in fact, we should not get a linear Hubble law. Yeah? In fact, we should start seeing some curvature. Does that argument make sense? Why, why, should I see this, why should I see the curvature? Why is it true that at the higher distances, I'm, I'm saying the higher distance means I'm sitting here? Because the light is coming to you from a farther back time. Good, right? yes. So light, light has a finite travel time, and so it takes a certain length of time to reach us. That's why. Everyone fine? OK. So we are looking for curvature in this. OK. Um, and uh, so, so, so this one is, is spelling out that curvature, right? Uh, that uh, if the universe was uh, expanding faster in the past or slower in the past. Okay. Um, there's a bunch of distances you'll be talking about, right? So I, so I will skip this, but they're here on the slides for later. Anjan will be, will be covering some of this. Um, okay. Um, oh, so we've already been through this slide. Here's the data. Unfortunately, it's not shown in the way I would like, okay? Because on this axis is Z, so that's like the recession speed, C is CZ, okay? And this axis is distance, but it's really the log of the distance. And because it's the log of the distance, it looks like it's very curved, but this is not the curvature that we're talking about, that I was talking about on the previous slide, okay? <coughs> so a, a better plot is this one, where this is log of the, the speed and the log of the distance. Okay, now it looks more linear. Okay, um, and uh, and so 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 what is plotted here is a bunch of da different data sets. Um, these are nearby, low redshift supernovae, going to higher and higher and higher redshifts. Okay. Sitting on here are a bunch of different curves, and these different curves correspond to different expansion histories. Okay, so the first thing to note is. So this is the velocity, this was the distance, and we said, you know, if the universe had expanded faster in the past, this should curl this way. If anything, this is curving up, not down. So that was the surprise, right? So that means that the universe was expanding slower in the past. Okay. Um, and uh, and so, so these are, these are some different models. Um, compared to the favored one. This is what everyone was expecting 20 years ago, and, uh, and this, is, this is the preferred model. Um, and uh, so, 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 so Anjan will go through, I think, and will define for you the different uh, densities in matter and in dark energy. So we, the dark energy is the word that we have to say the universe is accelerating instead of decelerating. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so all the curves, so there are many different curves here, okay? We're taking the model that we think is the best fit, and we're plotting the difference of each data point to that best fit curve. So that is called the residual. And so for the best fit model, which in this case is a model that has uh, 0.7 for the cosmological constant, 0.3 for, uh, for the matter. So this is how different the data are compared to the prediction of that kind of universe. Okay. A universe that is only matter, that's down here. And so that's to show you the data are very discrepant with that. Um, and a universe that has no matter and has only dark energy, the data are, are discrepant with that also. Right? So it's somewhere in between. 
Um, okay. So the this is a even more blown up picture of that. Okay. This is think of this as the residuals. These are universes that are, have an expansion history where they're always decelerating. These are universes that are, I throw my keys up, or I throw this up, they fall back down. That is like a, that is like a closed universe. Expands and shrinks. If I throw my keys up, and they just keep going, escape speed, what's the escape speed from Earth? Okay, all right, so for those guys, Right? So if, if the universe was going at escape speed, that would be this flat. And the open is if it has more than the escape speed, but it keeps decelerating all the time. We believe that that is not what is happening. We believe that the universe is accelerated recently. But it, we have seen far enough in the past to see that there was a time when it was decelerating. Okay, so for a while it was decelerating and then recently it has started accelerating. We're getting this from looking at the standard candles, the supernovae. Okay. Um, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. The black are showing you the supernovae. <coughs> the red are a very, very different measure. These are, the, the red are coming from the clustering of galaxies, something called baryon acoustic oscillations that we'll discuss tomorrow, okay? But I want you to remember that the, what made the red is completely different systematics in the measurement than the black. And so it's quite remarkable that the agreement is there. Okay. Um, so so, so to, put, to put this kind of, data onto an estimate of the expansion history. Here is the present. We can ask, what was the past? And so in the past, we could have had a universe that was always decelerating. So this is the universe getting bigger, but slowing down. Or it could have decelerated and then accelerated. Okay, so there are very many different expansion histories. Um, I have a piece of chalk here. I could have drawn, like when I was throwing this up and down, I could have said, you know, that's a closed universe. That's an open universe. And then one that is accelerating is like this. As time goes on, this is some measure of the size or the separation between objects as time goes on. Okay, why am I showing the picture that way rather than this way? So let's think a little bit about this. Supposing I chose this way and I said, what's the present? 14 billion years? That's 14 billion years. A universe like this is already collapsing. So I've done something weird, because we know the universe is expanding. So it can be that this is not a viable model. But this is one that is collapsing. This is one that is expanding. This is one that is expanding even faster at the present time, that's not a very good way to compare the models because really what happened? Really, we measured the Hubble constant today. We know it's 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec, 67, 73, okay? We, we know that value. So what we want is that all the models should have this value. So we should not normalize the models to have the same beginning we should normalize them to have the same Hubble constant today. That's the difference. Okay? All right. So they're all normalized to have the same Hubble constant today, 
And now we can plot the data as a function of time backwards. We can plot them first as a function of, um, oh, I don't have redshift on here. I just have brightness. OK. Um, oh, here's the redshift. OK. Um, so redshift is this way. So they're further and further back. And further and further back means some number of years. OK. Um, and as they're further from us, their apparent brightness is fainter and fainter and fainter. OK. Um, and now we can ask, you know, which of these different cosmological models is most compatible with the data? OK. And so it, it's this kind of plot that is the basis for saying there was a, there was a regime when there was a deceleration before the acceleration. OK. Um, I'll show you a slightly, slightly better plot um, in a second. OK. Uh, I'll skip this, because this is also stuff Anjan will go through. Um, I just want to make this one plot, okay, which is showing you the density as a function of time in the universe. Okay? Um, and uh, so, so there, there are three curves on here. Let's look at the one that is blue. This one is the density in matter as a function of time. We think that the amount of matter in the universe is not being created or destroyed, and so it should scale as expansion factor cubed. Yeah, it should scale as the volume. Number of photons in the universe also scale as volume. But the energy will get an extra factor because the wavelengths all got stretched. So I get four powers of expansion factor. So the red is showing you to the fourth power. Blue is showing you to the third power. And the green is showing you a constant. So this guy is the cosmological constant. This guy is an energy density that is the same in space at all times. The Hubble constant is supposed to be the same in space, but may be different at different times. Universes that are decelerating and accelerating, their Hubble constant is different at different times. Yeah? So the cosmological constant is really constant. Okay. Um, and these curves are drawn so that the pink is much below the blue today. How do we know that? So we, so we measure the number of photons, number density of photons. They have a typical energy, so we get an energy density. And that number is, that, that is a small energy density. But they are scaling differently with time. So there was a time when the photons dominated. You guys who use the word recombination and stuff like that. So there was a time when the radiation dominated the matter. Yeah? Um, Similarly, there is a time when this cosmological constant dominates. And it happens to be pretty recent. If we had seen the supernovae, if the evidence for, if we had not seen deceleration, if we had only seen acceleration, if we had seen it pretty clearly, this green line would have been higher. Yeah? OK? Um, the final thing we don't know is, is this green line really flat? So it could change with time, stuff like that. Okay. Um, as time goes on, we will be trying to make measurements of this quantity at bigger and bigger distances from us, earlier and earlier in the universe. And the goal is to figure out if this guy is really constant with time. No? Or if it's doing some kind of weird oscillations, stuff like that. In the model in which it is constant with time, would it make sense to look for dark energy at the time that the photons and the, and the matter decoupled? It would make no sense because it's many, many orders of magnitude down. So the observational 
indication of this dark energy is almost not there. Okay? So it's a consistency check just to make sure there's nothing strange happening back then. Okay? But that's the main reason why most galaxy surveys that are trying to constrain this guy are doing it at low redshift. Okay? They're not doing it with reionization. Okay? They're doing it with nearby galaxies. Okay? Um, let's skip some of this. Um, I'll skip all of this because Anjan will do that. This was the slightly better plot I was going to show you, uh, showing all the models normalized to the same Hubble constant today and showing a universe that decelerated and now accelerates. Okay. Um, okay. The last thing I want to look at on here um, is uh, a little bit of CMB. Then I'm done, right? Because, yeah. um, so, so that was supernovae. Okay, the supernovae were telling us about the expansion history. The other kind of geometrical test we try to do is using uh, the, the supernovae and saying that we know what the spots are. Yeah. Um, and so, so you guys know what made the CMB. Yeah, there was the electrons, photons scattering of the free electrons, universe becomes cool, Electrons are bound now to the protons, that, and hence the photons have nothing to scatter against. The photons have to have exactly the right energy to bounce an electron up. Okay. Um, so the universe becomes transparent. Yeah, so it was uh, previously very hot, then it became cool enough, and when it became cool enough, it became transparent. Okay. Uh, that's a map. The map, of course, uh, there's a lot of processing that has gone here. It looks very smooth to, then there's a dipole, and then you subtract the dipole, and then you're left with something like this. Yeah. Um, I'm showing you the, the difference between you know, 10 years ago and five years ago. It's not because the CMB evolved. Yeah, it's the technology evolved. Yeah, um, and so, um, so the spots, we see them more clearly, but where it was hot, it was hot. Where it was cold, it was cold. Yeah? Okay. Um, all right, it's a Planck spectrum. Uh, these were the numbers you were quoting me, the number density of photons given a Planck spectrum. So these are things that we can just calculate from, from fundamental physics. Yeah? Okay. Um, here's the geometry test. So we see spots, and uh, now we can ask... Uh, so the spots subtend uh, physical size. This was the speed of light, age of the universe, at the time of decoupling. OK. Um, that gives us a size. There's a distance to the last scattering surface from 14 billion years to 300,000 years after the Big Bang, right? So roughly 14 billion light years. So we know this distance, we know this physical size, and so we can ask what angle is consistent with that. If the geometry is flat like we're used to, then we expect a certain angle. If the geometry is closed, then we expect a bigger angle, meaning the spots should look big. And otherwise, if the universe is open, we expect to see the, sh the spots all looking smaller. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that's a geometrical test that tells you uh, this is the right model, and these two models are not, are not consistent with the data. Okay. Um, and so, so, so I just want to do this one quickly, because what we will do in much more detail uh, tomorrow is we will do this, but not just at the time of the CMB, but at many later times in the universe's history. Okay. And uh, so, so that, that's a very nice method, because otherwise the CMB, you get to do the geometry test with one snapshot, not with multiple. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I, I will, because I'm out of time, I think I should stop now, right? Or, or can I keep going? Another five minutes? Okay. Um, okay. So. Uh, this is the physics of the CMB. There's this very nice website called background.uchicago.edu. I encourage you all to go look at it. Okay? 
Uh, this is not a course on the, uh, so this one is not a course on the CMB, but if you wanted a good course on the CMB, that one is it. Okay. Um, what, so, so what's being pictured here? So, so we look at the, the, those hot and cold spots, all right? And, uh, and we have this idea that the hot and cold spots are telling us that one place in the universe was hotter and colder than the other. But the sky is actually a flat thing on the sky. And so what is the conversion from something that was 3D, hot or cold, to the spots on the sky? And so this is trying to, sh trying to illustrate that. Okay? So the idea is that, uh, that you have some place in the universe. Um, and this place in the universe, um, so, 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 so this is the universe, OK? And you have a perturbation, which is the simplest one you can think of, a sine wave. Okay? And, so, and there's a sine wave that is oscillating up and down. Okay? So it's hot and cold and hot and cold. Okay? That's what's happening. Now, in this place, you have photons. Okay? And the photons are scattering off all, all the electrons. And so that's the initial scattering that you see. And they keep scattering until the universe became cool enough that they stopped scattering, after which they travel in a straight line. OK? And so, so, so what you see is you see them scatter. And then the, you know, each, a photon that was emitted from here scatters, 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 and then travels in a straight line. You, the observer, are here. What do you see? OK? So in the very beginning, you will only see the sources that were close to you that sent that the photons arrived to you. So you will see everyone the same as you. But as time goes on, you will receive photons from further and further away. Yeah? When you start receiving them from further and further away, so there will be this shell, right, as time goes on from a more and more distant shell. And that shell will sample this wave. And so that shell will be broken up into hot and cold places because of that wave. Okay? And fundamentally, that's what you're observing. Right? You're observing that. Now, now just imagine that it's not one simple sine wave. You have a collection of many sine waves. But the, the fundamental idea is that. And it's the collection of all these signals projected on your sky for this reason that is the CMB that you observe. OK? Um, so so there's, a, there's a lot in this slide, right? I've done, what, 30 seconds on it. So go to the website, have a look. Um, all right. Um, so now, so now there, there are a bunch of, there's a bunch of information in, on here about, uh, about what makes the CMB the information that is encoded in the CMB. So one of the things that's encoded in the CMB is the interaction between the photons and the baryons. And so if you have more, so, 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 so what do you have? There's the sine wave that is going up and down. Okay? But these oscillations will be tempered by the photons that interact with the baryons. If there are more baryons, then, the, the, then what will happen? Then as photons push baryons, then there will be more momentum in the baryons. Okay? The photons will deposit more, more energy into the baryons. But the baryons will expand. The baryons will push against each other. They will push back because of this oscillation. right? And so the amplitude of this oscillation will depend on how many baryons there are. And so that's what this is trying to illustrate, that if there are more baryons, then the oscillation is, is deeper. If there are fewer baryons, the oscillation is less. Okay? Um, and so. Uh, let me skip this. Another effect. So there, there are these oscillations, right? However, so it depends on the number of baryons. In addition, what's happening is that the universe is expanding. And so if you think of these oscillations as being associated with a potential, that potential well, so that was the, that was the reason for, for, for showing the, the spring doing like this. As time goes on and the universe expands, then the potentials are all getting stretched 
because the potentials are getting stretched, they are not as deep as they were before. And so the potential, which was like this, becomes flatter at late times. And that means that the oscillations that we're doing like this, at late times, they do like that, because the confining potential has flattened out. OK? And so that means that the amplitude of the oscillations, the, the fact that the potential is changing is encoded in the amplitude of the oscillations. And so, so at the end of the day, when we measure the power spectrum of the fluctuations of the CMB, then we get a bunch of information. So now I've used the technical word. I've said power spectrum. How many people, how many people have seen a picture like this before? Probably most of you. Half of you have not. How many have not seen a picture like this? OK, all right. Um, so, so, so we should talk about this, because the course is not going to be about this stuff. Okay? This is stuff that is known from the CMB. It's not structure formation. There's one aspect of this that I will use. Um, but uh, but it's, a, it's sort of good general knowledge uh, to, to know what signatures are in the CMB. Okay? And the signatures that are in the CMB are, um, so, so in the amplitude of the, 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 the spectrum of the fluctuations, if you have lots of baryons, then you have very obvious oscillations. If you have uh, matter determines some of the geometry, and so you have where the peak of these curves is occurring is slightly different, okay? depending on the amount of uh, matter in the universe. The geometry here, you really see the curvature, so the real geometry of the universe. Um, and, uh, and then the amount of dark energy makes a uh, difference mainly over, over here. So this is just, just to illustrate that there's a lot of information in measuring the size of the spots of the CMB. Yeah, so you should, you should think of this plot as just a, a way of quantifying the sizes of the spots in the CMB. Okay. Um, and uh, let me, the, the, the crude way to think of them is sort of summarized here. The main peak is happening at a multipole of about 200. That corresponds to an angular scale of about a degree. Okay. Um, and that's the size of the spots, about the size of the moon okay, on the sky. Um, these other oscillations, they're telling you uh, the ratio. Um, so this is how many baryons there are. This one is the matter content without the baryons. Okay. So as you measure more and more features, then you measure more and more parameters in the standard model. Okay. Um, the, how quickly this thing decays is telling us is actually a combination of things. I've written only the thickness of the last scattering surface. It was not instantaneous. Uh, but also, the photons and the baryons were not perfectly coupled. And so because they were not perfectly coupled, this thing decays slightly. Okay. Um, and uh, so, so there's, there's a bunch of information in here that, um, that serves as the backbone for modern cosmology. Right? Um, the final, final piece of information that's in here, um, though, though not in this particular plot, um, sort of in this plot, but it's nicer with her polarization, is, um, OK. The universe is made of photons, baryons, dark matter. We can ask, those fluctuations that we said are 2 times 10 to the minus 5. If I had more baryons, did I have more dark matter, more photons? Did I have more of everything? Or so, so if that is true, we call that adiabatic initial conditions. If you have more of everything or less of everything. But it could have been that you have same photons everywhere, same temperature everywhere, just more matter in one place as the initial conditions. Okay? Or it could have been 
that are, if you have more photons, you have fewer baryons, so that the combination of the energy density is constant. Right? So the perturbation in one could cancel the perturbation in the other. And so, so that's a different kind of initial condition for the universe. And the CMB strongly favors adiabatic, meaning if there's more of one, there's more of the others too. Okay. And that, that will be important in, uh, l later next week, uh, tomorrow day after. Okay. So, so this is a plot I wanted you to see, right, as, uh, as where we get a bunch of cosmological parameters from. I don't have time to go through it in the CMB how all this works, but, but this, is where, this is where it's coming from. Um, and let me skip this um, and just, uh, uh, just put up the, the parameters that we get from the CMB um, and stop there. So we have uh, um, essentially six parameters that define the standard cosmological model. These parameters are how many baryons, so the density of baryons, the density of matter, um, the age of the universe. And then we have um, three numbers that we haven't talked about. We'll talk about these two uh, it, starting tomorrow. Okay. This is basically so we had fluctuations that are 10 to the minus 5. So why 10 to the minus 5 and not 10 to the minus 8? So the amplitude of the fluctuations. And the second is, um, so, so this one is basically related to um, the fluctuations. Are there fluctuations on all scales or just on one scale? Or, you know, sort of what's setting this shape? So for example, This thing could have been tilted up this way. It could have been tilted down this way. What is setting this shape, the overall shape um, with the oscillations on top? right? Um, and so there are predictions for these. Um, and, uh, and then, and then the, the, the standard model basically needs these five numbers I've talked about and a sixth to, to set the stage for galaxy formation, right? For the galaxy surveys. The rest um, of the numbers are derived from the first six or? Um, so the ones that are derived are these, right. okay? But so I these numbers, the but the, the, and right, so these are not derived, okay? So these other numbers are, this is the total of all the energy densities, that one is, in some analyses, is assumed to be one. So in the analysis that was done by the Planck survey, it was assumed to be one, but it can be some models, they set it free. So you first it comes out. No and then... That's right. So the, yeah, so, so the, initial, the initial analyses set these fixed. Okay. And then subsequently, papers have come where they, they allow different ones of these to float. right? Um, and uh, allowing some of these to float affects the, the error bars here. right? Um, and uh, so I, I mainly wanted to show you that we get a bunch of information from the CMB as the starting point. And then, uh, and so we'll sort of take that as given, and then we'll start asking what happens now after the CMB was formed for structure formation. Okay. Um, so that was like a whirlwind tour through geometrical stuff in, uh, in cosmology. And what we'll do next time is uh, the growth of structure tests of cosmology rather than geometry. Sorry I'm late.